We're just going to kick it off with some breeding talk and genetics. And then uh, in about 45 minutes, we'll shift gears and get legal and talk plant patents and IP and fun stuff. So uh, Trevor, the stage is yours. Right on. Thank you, Peter. So yeah, I'm sitting here with two incredibly well-versed individuals who have been engaged in this industry and you know before it was an industry really have their roots going back to when it was a community i've got josh d on my left hello everybody for those who don't know josh d is one of the people who brought us all the og and we're all greatly appreciative out here on the west coast so thank you man well thanks for everyone out there to keep growing her as much as she needs it because la needs og <laughs> Indeed. And on my right, I've got Mojave Richmond. And Mojave, he's got incredible experience as well. Breeder of the Sage, long time experience, both here in the States and also internationally, which gives him a unique perspective on everything that's going down. So right on. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure to be here, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, um, I was hoping that we could just get into a discussion about the current state of cannabis genetics. Let's talk about where we've been, where we're at right now, what is the cannabis genome as it currently, the state of the cannabis genome right now. And so to kick that off, I think it m would probably be good for Mojave to go first, just because Mojave, Mojave, for anybody who doesn't know, works with Rob Clark. He's got lots of experience in terms of talking with one of the foremost experts in learning and understanding this plant from somebody who really knows the deep history of the plant. And so, yeah, you want to start us off? Sure. Right on. Um, well, I guess to really address where the cannabis genome is today, we got to talk about where it was in the past and where it came from. Um, cannabis is, you know, quite possibly the most, um, the, the most significant human plant relationship is that between humans and cannabis. It dates back, you know, over 6,000 years and um, pretty much evolved from Central Asia, found its way down into India and Afghanistan and Thailand and from those regions spread throughout the world. Um, and initially it was uh, land race based genetics, which means a population of seeds that come from a specific region that are bred for a particular use by those people in that region over time. And land race genetics had to be um, incredibly dynamic. So it had to be a diverse genome with the dynamic, uh, uh, enough dynamism that it could respond to the um, ever-changing environmental stresses. So those land race genetics that evolved over hundreds, possibly thousands of years, eventually spread around the world. And they went to Mexico and Africa and South America and Thailand and everywhere. But they were predominantly um, narrow leaf varieties that had um, a fairly specific targeted genome because they were selected as um, Cincimia single plants. So essentially a farmer would grow a plant and select the best seeds from those plants. And that was the way people selected cannabis for um, thousands of years. And eventually those seeds got spread out and then after prohibition, when the US you know, imparted its grand wisdom on the world and decided that people shouldn't smoke cannabis or consume cannabis or use it for fiber or for food, um, those populations became ever more secluded and um, harder to get to. And eventually, they all found their way more or less to California, because California, for better or worse, is an exceptional place. And the people here fell in love with cannabis in an exceptional way. And those land race-based genetics, um, those narrow leaf varieties, they had a very specific um, genetic makeup. And um, we could talk about that a little bit more as we go along. But um, they pretty much made up what cannabis was up until the 80s when prohibition had driven cannabis um, into the small grows and small underground gorilla grows out in the 
in the hills of California and the hills of Oregon, and people needed smaller, more compact, um, easier to sell cannabis that could be could, could evade um, law enforcement, you know, and could be grown indoors. So at that point, it was a critical juncture in the cannabis genome in that these land race based genetics that were from all over the world and were predominantly narrow leaf got married with this one very specific population of genetics, which was Afghani based genetics. And those Afghani based genetics that more or less joined the rest of the world in the 80s kind of came to shape what the, geno the cannabis genome is today because we all had to grow indoors. And in order to grow indoors, you need a small plant. You need a plant that finishes relatively early. And you need um, you know, something that you can pull off um, indoors. And you can't do that with narrow leaf varieties. Narrow leaf varieties are big, giant Christmas trees that take a long time and yield very low. So something very specific happened to this cannabis genome in the past 20, 30 years. And it was pre pre predominantly driven by law enforcement. And then it was championed by us, by us cannabis breeders and enthusiasts, and then specifically championed and distributed around the world from the Dutch seed banks. And when the Dutch seed banks in the 90s got a hold of these new Afghani narrow leaf hybrids, um, they were distributed everywhere. And everyone had the same issue. They needed something that grew fast, and they needed something that was short, and they needed something that was potent, they needed something that they could sell for top dollar because it was really dangerous and risky to grow cannabis. So that has really driven us to where we are now. Uh, we're at this kind of crossroads now. We're in post-prohibition, and we're now looking at what is this new cannabis genome that we have now. And people are thinking about, well, what's the future of, of cannabis going to be? And what are these selections going to be that, that drive the market as the years go by? And so we're at a kind of a, a, a interesting crossroads where we no longer have the, the selective forces that were imposed on us by prohibition, but we now have a very um, broad palette to work with. But at the same time, cannabis genome is nowhere near as diverse as it once was. Because all those land race based varieties, even though we got, we got some great unicorns from them and we bred with them, the populations are gone. And when the population is gone and the people that bred those populations, you no longer have the diversity in the gene pool. So now we have amazing plants that came from those populations, but we don't have the genetic diversity to move the needle left and right in the way that we once had. Even though we're way further ahead than ever, we're still compromised by that. So now the challenge is us as breeders is to figure out what society demands from cannabis and what the industry demands from cannabis and how to achieve that with a somewhat limited gene pool. Um, and I guess that's, that's as much as I have to say now about that. Cool. Yeah, uh, I think that brings up a really good point in terms of how there are cultural implications and cultural pressures and selective pressures that go on in terms of what we as a community of farmers and cultivators select for and what we're trying to do. And that's culturally dependent. You look at the South Asian cultures where it was predominantly selecting for flowers. You look at the hashish cultures of Central Asia and then the hemp cultures that have also proliferated around the world. And every single culture throughout time has gotten a hold of this plant and figured out how to adapt it to their own region and to their own purposes. And we need to recognize that. And the most baffling thing, it's been both a double-edged sword, you know, there's positives and negatives about it. One. Here we are now, and cannabis has sort of survived the great bottlenecking that we have seen in every other agricultural crop because of prohibition. But we've also seen a lot of forces where we had to operate and make selections and work with populations that were tiny. And that brings up something that I think Josh D. knows a lot about, and that's the proliferation of these elite cultivars the OGs, the chems, and some of the things that predate those, the hazes, the northern lights, and the skunks. 
these elite cultivars that really have formed the basis of our genetics and from, I would say, the 80s to the present are what we know of as the cannabis genome and what we're all trying to strive for and do and reproduce. We're all chasing out after that next OG, that next skunk, that next new new. <laughs> and you're somebody who's brought something into the community, kept it going, and helped us keep these heirloom varieties of elite genetics. And can you speak to that and how we keep those going? I mean, I, I think after all this time, uh, there was at a, a certain point after like four years and I was like, wow, this OG Kush thing, like everybody loves it, you know, and it's nothing really special that we did. You know, it was just the indoor scene was coming ahead. And I remember back when I was young, if you had indoor, that meant it smelled like hay and nobody wanted it. You know, that was, it's like, oh, you got that crap indoor. And it was like, oh, do you have that Mendo or Humboldt or like some, you know, somebody who was growing it that had some skills. And even with the transportation of smuggling it down here, you know, it still was the very best when I was probably becoming, you know, a, a huge cannabis enthusiast in my, you know, as a teenager, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it was interesting because, you know, all of a sudden this indoor thing happened and OG Kush comes on the scene and, you know, I'm, I'm basically lucky enough that it crosses my path, right? So everybody knows I didn't create this. And now that we discovered recently this year that the guy that did create it did it by accident. You know, this wasn't something that he had, you know, done some sort of like real work on. Um, and I think that's interesting how th those things um, come about. Um, so here we are, and I just felt like... Um, I started growing OG in 96, Thank you. but in 91, is it Sherry? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, 91, I think, is when we found out that this accidental pollination uh, moment happened and TK and OG were created. Um, Some weird road trip from, like, Florida to California. That happened in 96. Yeah, and so, I mean, uh, I'm a huge fan of this one cultivar, so... It was easy to just focus and stop growing everything else. Um, it was uh, really kind of a spindly plant that doesn't pr didn't produce a lot with the techniques we had at the time. But it was so good that we were like, oh, we're going to figure this out. It doesn't matter you know, if it gets half of what we're getting with NL or whatever else we were growing. That was a good move. You know? And there are a lot of people at some point uh, at some point, that actually left my hands, and thank God I gave it to my guy Ian up in the Bay Area. And Ian is really kind of like the godfather of of good weed in the San Fernando Valley, and um, for a lot of reasons. And nobody knows who he is; he doesn't get any credit. He's very humble. But if it wasn't for him, thank God he was holding on to some cuts of that, and it was easy. It was like, hey, and I'm coming up and grab some cuts, you know. Um, but these are strange things because now I see. You know, in hindsight, I had no idea that this would become much bigger than, you know, it was like a change the game. Um, this is because it became the genetic backbone almost of all the flavors we love today. You know, and OG has its found, it's like a cornerstone, you know, variety that will always probably remain like that. But uh, now I see it's the diversity in cannabis is always attached to the OG when people want to punch. Like, when, when add a little kick to my favorite flavor. And you know, it's interesting and fascinating what Mojave says about not having that much of a, of a gene pool to choose from to take it to the next level. It seems like we really all just jumped in in the last decade or 15 years and just mixing everything up. And now it's hard to pull back unless you have original stock, you know, which is hard now because you have had to have it stored properly, number one. That person still has to be alive and out of prison, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it's cool to think because guys like Mojave and Rob Clark, I know that they have a good stash. Like we, we all know that. Um, it's it's yeah. true. Well, uh, we we um, long ago we we I I can't speak for Rob, um, but a long ago I, I was born in Big Sur, um, California, in 1969, and um, my family had already been in the cannabis industry for a few years, um, and the. The, the land that we lived on, a place called Plaskett Ridge in Big Sur, um, 
It was in 1965, a few years before I was born, that my, f my mother and father invited a friend of theirs to come and stay with us. Um, and he ended up, we ended up moving, and he stayed there. And he became a grower. And his name's Patrick Cassidy. And Patrick Cassidy coined the Big Sur Holy Weed. And Patrick Cassidy started the first um, harvest parties ever in the New World. Um, they were called the California Harvest Party. And every year, a shitload of hippies, um, you can go online, you can find a little bit of information about this, but like a, a sea of VW buses <laughs> would descend upon Big Sur, and we'd have these big harvest parties. I can vaguely remember them um, up until around eight years old is when I think they ended. Um, and it was a big pagan cannabis festival. At the, end of every, at the end of the night, they take the biggest and best plant and burn it on the bonfire where all the naked people ran around. And I mean, it, was, it was a real cannabis community. And um, that's what Big Sur and, and um, Mendocino and Oregon and a lot of these places on the West Coast were doing heavily in the 70s. And, but right around um, the end of the 70s and the early 80s when the Afghani genetics um, came in and started mixing, there was something that happened, something, something um, that you could put your finger on, which was that everything changed. So at that moment, the community reacted. The community said, hey, what happened to our cannabis? I mean, it was, uh, I, mean I, I can literally remember people saying, how come we don't have the weed from last year? You know, and that was like 1982, 1983. And at that moment, every, the, the genome kind of merged between these two big populations of these narrow leaf and these broadleaf plants, and we came up with all the hybrids of today. So um, when I moved to Amsterdam in 1993 and was fortunate enough to have some old school California genetics to work through, I was very fortunate to find something that was indicative of those old flavor profiles and those old effects that came with the old school land race based stuff. So at that moment, I decided that I would spend my life working that line. Um, and I've bred that specific line over and over again and never tried to deviate too much, except after meeting this gentleman over 20 years ago <laughs> and being introduced to OG Kush, which is the world's most impactful plant. And Josh said something really interesting. He said, um, it wasn't a big breeding experiment that produced OG Kush. We're talking about breeding, right? And everyone wants to think about breeding as being this new big industrial commercial thing. But it was a couple beans from an accidental cross that pulled out the most impactful plant that we've ever known. Yeah. So it's luck. When, when, and, and it's luck and a vision. You know, when people know good weed, and they can pull good beans out of good weed, they come up with amazing things. And that was just a moment in time, and it happened. And that's why we have OG Kush. And I just, just want to applaud that, that it could have, could have not happened easily. <laughs> could have easily not happened. Anyway, so I crossed my stuff with OG. That was the one thing that I crossed it with. And that shit came out bomb. Yeah, exactly. It did, because it added exactly what it needed, was punch. That was the truth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something that we also, as we move into more of a corporate cannabis and when margins and bottom lines make the decision on everything, is the next OG going to be selected and kept? I don't know, you know? If it doesn't yield and doesn't lunk for the people who are trying to pull weight, the OG will get pushed to the side. But instead, because people saw value in something, in Florida, of all places. I mean, yeah. Florida in the early 90s, y'all. I like, thought the same thing. That was like... Yeah. When Matt Berger was like, man, we got this stuff in Florida. It's like, bro, it's, it's the best shit you ever smoked. I'm like, there's no fucking... <laughs> no, we're I, like in California, Matt. We know Matt's from Florida. I was like, we're in California now, man. Like, come on, you know. And I, I got yeah, mad was, respect for everybody who... I grew up in this shit. Like, I grew up in... I was on ignorant. a fucking commune, yeah. off the grid, totally backwoods. Everybody I knew grew weed. I was literally growing weed as a homeschool like, student as a 16-year-old. And I was handed marijuana botany and told, here you go, kid, figure it out. Now, 
that right there was some shit where it was easy. And we, we went through so many sh plants, we never saved any cuts, we were all seed-based, and we saw gene flow going all over the place. But cats back east were doing some crazy shit under some serious prohibition and risk, and they were holding on to some stuff, and we all have to be very thankful of all the cats back east, the, you know, the sours, the chems, the OGs, you know, it all comes back, all genetics come back to California, thankfully, but we're, we're very lucky and blessed for the fact that people made selections not based off of what was the most heavy yielding, what was the most vigorous plant, but instead, what was the most unique and most desirable plant. And that they then went around and shared this and saved it and held it and, you know, people held things closely in their circles. And if we didn't have that cultural dynamic and didn't have our own culture operating, you know, with the prohibition bullshit on the top of it, like, we wouldn't be where we are now. And so thank you to all of you who have saved, collected, and persevered through this prohibition bullshit. Yeah, it was um, living in Amsterdam in the 90s was an interesting experience in that um, my, my, my best friend from childhood owned a, a seed company, Adam Dunn. Um, I've known him all my life. And um, my girlfriend at the time was the girl who sold seeds at the Cincy Seed Bank. She was the one who took your ticket at the Hash Museum, and she was the one who sold you seeds. So I fell into this community where where everyone from around the world would come to open up. So all these insular communities in Florida and Arkansas and Indiana and, and, and California, they all, everyone was hush-hush. And, and that hush-hush thing kept those gene pools alive as well. I mean, that's why we had those plants. And that's why we had the diversity back then is because when everyone found a, a plant that they loved, they didn't share it. Another group had to find the plant that they loved. Another group had to find the plant that they loved. It wasn't just, hey, let's all share the same plants. So in Amsterdam, everyone would show up and share their stories and share their genetics. And it was like this kind of open community. And that's why, you know, and then the Dutch seed companies, they absorbed those genetics and then in turn brought them to the world. But it was this fact that, that for a one, there was one place where these little insular communities could come and share that they were their, their, their um, common experience. And um, that, was a, that was a time, that was a unique time. And that's when, you know, if you look back, you know, those of us who've been doing this for a while, if you think back about the cannabis genome in the late 90s and the early 2000s, there was a lot of amazing plants around. Yeah. A lot of them. And they were all different. All of them. And some of them came from little groups that, that had no relations to anything else. Like, hey, I've been over here in Indiana doing our bubble gum, and I've been over here in Florida doing our, our TK and stuff like that. And, and it was that prohibition dynamic that allowed for that to happen. And we don't have that anymore. You know, yeah. we, now we have, you know, we can all just buy clones at, at a shop. So it's, once again, we're at a really interesting crossroads when we're talking about the, the genome, about breeding, about what people want from the plant. Um, and it's, we almost have, as breeders, a, a responsibility to explore that and then to provide that, provide the outcome that facilitates what people want. And it's challenging because we also have to pay the bills. So. The driving force now is uh, bag appeal. It initially, was what what puts what sells cannabis at a dispensary. Like individual consumer. Yeah, exactly. Is that? Yeah. Um, yes. Experience. Yes. We'll take questions at the end. I think is what we'll do. Yeah. Thank you very much. But but no, it is. And now, well, it's interesting that you know bag appeal and smell and flavor and presentation of the flower was what drove the market for a number of years. But now, it's brands, because now we have packaged cannabis, so we can't look at it, smell it, and engage it in the same way. But the plants that sold themselves for years became the brands. So now people are, have those memories of where what what that plant was. So now they don't have to think, well, what's going to be in this jar? You know, 
Dude, the price to enter the cannabis space right now is, you know, obnoxious. You know, so it's like if you were uh, at an era of time where everybody was in a band, and we're all playing music, and the music was rich, and everybody got like, a chance to come up on stage and play, and then it's shifted to, well, you can only play if you pay. Right. You know, right. and you can only play for all these other stipulations, and all the best, hungriest, most talented musicians usually can't function that well under such structure. And this is like, this is mega structure right now. This is like uber structured, very opposite of what we're all about. So it's, it feels like these two worlds are meeting. And you know, so the result um, is the cannabis genome and diversity will be limited to the only the people that could enter the space. So when you go to a shop, all you get is whatever was the highest seller in BDS analytics. And, you know, you have, anybody knows what that bullshit is. So, you know, I can tell you the five top strains and, you know, varieties, and you'll be like, well, I hope then in a year from now there's more than that available. But people do follow that way, right? So to enter the space expensive, most of those guys coming into this space, they don't understand how it works or the culture. You know, they, and so it becomes a little bit more difficult to navigate through. So they jump back to, hey, we'll just follow whatever's popular. And then there's too much of that going on and creates a flat market. And I, I've seen it in other states I've been involved with. And it takes time to mature. And you hope that guys stick into it and find a way to, to get through, you know, the three year moment. And then you can start getting back to your craft again and uh, start focusing on new, you know, new varieties and, and such. Yeah, no, that's one thing. We're in a major culture clash right now. The culture that we come from and the cultural dynamics that we've historically had are totally butt up against some highly capitalized people who don't have a lot of respect for the culture. And so uh, right now, uh, the main thing that we're all trying to figure out is how do we, who have historically been involved in this, and in whatever capacity, we need to figure out how to link up together and build cultural resilience so that the Josh D's of the world, the Mojave's, and the, you know, the Trevor Whitkeys, the kids who are just totally backwoods and off the grid, how do we all figure out how to get through this? Because we've got a lot of cultural knowledge and expertise that could get lost, and if it's all just about margins and there's no culture there, then what's gonna happen? Like, we've seen Budweiser, we've seen that, and we've also heard everybody saying, oh, craft is the way, craft will save us. But is craft just saying craft and just being like, oh, I produce quality, is that sufficient? Or do we have to do more in terms of figuring out how to develop strategies for moving forward in this you know, new capitalized world we're in? Well, you, you mentioned um, craft, which I think is a, a really interesting um, analogy to make is a lot of, a couple of years ago, there were some groups, I, I will not mention names, but there were some groups that were going around California saying, hey, everyone's going to get to stay in the cannabis business. And there's 50,000 people who grow and provide cannabis, and there's 50,000 people who work in the craft beer and, and boutique wine industry, and there's room for everyone. You know, and that was this false sense of security that, every, that was spread around in, in order for us to move this industry forward. And I understand why those groups did that, because they wanted to legalize cannabis, and God bless them for it. But the reality is, is there's not room for everybody. And craft beer, um, if you want to draw a comparison, is kind of interesting, because after Prohibition, Prohibition wiped out all craft alcohol completely, just decimated it, especially distilleries and small brewers. And it took a long time for craft to reemerge. And the reality is that it reemerged from one brewery. There was one brewery in San Francisco called Anchor Steam Brewery, and they were the last man standing. They were the last craft beer company that survived prohibition. People think craft beer is a new thing. Craft beer was how beer was made forever. And then came conglomerate alcohol. And then it took a long time of a lot of shitty beer for people to say, gee, wouldn't it be nice if I could have something that was decent? And so Anchor Steam was the one survivor. And there was one rich benefactor, the, the Maytag blue cheese heir, who reinvigorated um, Anchor Steam. 
And then when Anchor Steam got momentum, Sierra Nevada jumped in, and then came Lagunitas, and yada, yada, and then here we are today. We're all drinking craft beer. It's great. But it took 60 years or so, or 40 years, of shitty beer. <laughs> OK, so uh, that's what we're facing. We're facing a lot of years of shitty weed to get back to craft, you know? And if you look in California specifically, where we had a really robust craft cannabis industry, they were called grow rooms and small, you know, illegal grows. They're all gone. And now we have commercial cannabis, and there's very few people who can produce that level, like Josh does, on a commercial scale. Yeah. It's very rare. And especially when you're exporting that same concept around the world, it's, it's even rarer. People in Macedonia are not going to learn how to grow craft cannabis. They're going to learn how to grow commercial cannabis. Wow. So let's just be cognizant of the way big industry takes over and how long it takes to get back in the door. Yeah. No, and for us in California, particularly Northern California, that means Calaveras County. We had wineries that operated all the way through Prohibition. But once legalization of alcohol happened, the repeal of prohibition rather, it was impossible for all those wineries to continue operating because of the cost of licensing. We're all experiencing that exact same dynamic now. And so for small communities that rely on this, we absolutely have to be cognizant of what the implications are. And if we want to spend the next 40 years fighting the good fight to, you know, have local craft industries, that's kind of that's one possibility, or another possibility is getting together, making local changes politically, staying organized, and actually making sure that we can shape this industry. And we also, there's a political strategy that has to be implemented, but there's also commercial strategies. We have to link up together and figure out how to build brands, build things like Josh D is built, like Mojave is built. And so when we come together at these events, we need to network, we need to meet each other, and really look at strategies. This is not just about getting together and talking or having people on panels, but it's about developing strategies for cultural resilience and moving this community forward. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. A absolutely, and and um, let me jump in there real quick. Yeah, I think um, the the thing is, there's a lot of fantastic growers that I know in this state or in the West Coast. I mean, or at least in the areas I've had the, uh, you know time spending in. Um, and I was first of all, I love the diversity. I think like during the medical days when you could walk in and there was, you know, a lot more to choose from. It was much more hands on. It was like you know, it felt like inclusive. You know. Um, in those days of having, um, just having an opportunity to see all that diversity up in Washington and then during the medical days and when it went, when it went wreck and they had promised the whole entire medical community in the state, and it's part of the reason it got voted in um, was because they were not gonna touch medical, right? So. Uh, luckily, I moved up there about five years ago and got to experience what LA was like probably 12 years, you know, probably 16 years ago. And it was really cool, right? So then REC comes in and they bring a couple lobbyists in and they squash it and completely dismantle medical. And it became so disconnected from the community, absolutely. Um, but you were saying something earlier um, as well that, first of all, it doesn't have to be like that. Like, and I'm here to make sure, like, I'm going to do my best till the day I die to make sure that we put out, like, the best weed we can. We hope everybody's happy and wants that, you know, like, to continue to support us, you know. Um, we've had some bumps in the road, but, you know, like any new industry, this happens. We're a startup. Um, the direction starts changing, though, when the investors want the money faster than it's like humanly possible regulations are you know on you and then it's like how come you don't grow gorilla glue you know that kind of thing and it's like i swear to god we don't want any more gorilla glue you know and uh um you know even if it's not og we we diversify and we change and if the public says you know they want something different it's nice to go after it but to not be able to and then you get the handcuffs on you and then people start looking at us as a company like 
God, how come, you know, you're not providing anything special anymore? You know, and you have to provide something special. This is like a specialty market. It's not a commodities market. And, uh, you know, there's, it's not just the people in this room. I mean, California really, like, respects and enjoys fine cannabis, fine wine, fine music, all the best shit, you know? I mean, we're lucky to be out here in the West Coast. And it reflects the rest of the world. The whole industry, I mean, I'm, the whole world looks at the California industry and the market, and we dictate the trends here. We do a lot of the times. And if, like, we fold in and don't fight for genetic diversity and something special, then it really will go away. Like, and, it, and, it, and I've seen that happen. Have you ever been to Colorado? It happens there a lot as well. Like I watched that where the grows got so large and then we go try to find good weed at shops and it's really hard. It's really far and few between. And, but I think out here, we're not at that point. We're really at a great point for this discussion to happen. So we can go ahead and produce fine product and brand yourself and with your merchandise and your marketing to really staying genuine to what you're about and have a distribution network where you know you can get your product out there which is what you need to be successful as well so the, all these different components that i think people don't recognize what they are and sometimes i think they sound a little bit more um like difficult to achieve than they they really need to be like a couple of us guys with a little bit of money like i know for sure we can come up with a, a distribution plan that makes a lot of sense and speaks to like all the different shops in california right and the bottleneck right now there isn't a lot of shops in california there's a lot of cultivation, and it's about probably in 12 months from now, it's going to be so saturated with people coming online that they're going to drop their price. And this is like that whole race to the bottom thing that you hear about, people talk about all the time. It's like, I can't sell my product. Next thing you know, it's a dollar a gram. And people are flipping for 450 a pound, and that becomes really difficult to have a business like that. Um, but it doesn't have to be like that. And the problem is, is when the weed goes down to 450 and people are selling ounces for 60 bucks or 80 bucks at a shop, the black market kind of goes away. And that's where you lo lose like a lot more diversity. You know, so it's just, there's this like um, cycle that's gonna happen, but I think really there's enough like talented, fun people here that really believe in this. And they put their, put their like, I guess, efforts together and their resources. You know, easy distribution chain, merchandising, marketing, fucking bomb product. It can it can work. You know. Yeah, I, on that level, we've got people, OGs, in every single point in the supply chain, and we just need to link up together. We have people who are, have distributing licenses. We have people with dispensary licenses. We have people who have nursery and cultivation licenses. And the key is to figure out how we normalize the supply chain and actually, uh, not just normalize, how do we optimize the supply chain so that all of the people who have been historically operating are kind of operating on a premise of like, oh, You've been historically operating. You've been producing fire, and you come from the culture, so I'm going to work with you, and I'm not going to work with these fucking chads. That seems like a fucking pretty reasonable, like, can't we all get down on that? Like, if you're a distributor, and you're, like, buying from the dude who wears, like, shorts to here that are pastel colors, stop. Just don't. Yeah. No, it's true. It is, it is abs that, is, that is very good. I have to admit, though, I'm still not quite sure what a Chad is. I know. He's what a is a Chad? Dick. He's it's, a dick. It's a hanging Chad. That's it. Right. That's it. Well, Florida. Yeah, no, it's true. And I have a corny thing that I like to say sometimes, which is, you know, us OGs, our roots run real deep. And like trees in the wind, we have to stand together if we don't want to get blown over. Because they will blow us all over. You know, the, the problem is is that we're all a bunch of different species of trees. We've got a redwoods and eucalyptus and <laughs> cypress and shit like that, and we're all trying to figure out how to work together. And it's hard. It takes, it takes you know what it is, is it, it requires the guy from the outside who understands how to, to connect us all. And it hasn't happened as, as fluidly as the, the pre-existing guys would have liked, yeah. but um, that's because there wasn't enough business savvy cats involved in the business. You know? uh. You know, unfortunately, unfortunately, or, or accountants and lawyers and all that shit that we trusted and could work with, you know. Yeah, we've got way too much stovepiping, so to speak. Yeah. Like, we're all in our own little niches and our own little worlds, and it's like, we got to move away from the, like, closed circle 
And I mean, closed circles are good. We got to keep our our trust and our community and stuff together, but we also have to have a networked community where part of it is recognizing people who have been doing this historically and who are really trying to make the transition both commercially and otherwise. Because a lot of this is also about individuals who are out there cultivating and we need to I want to see a like Autobahn society for cannabis, but instead of being like bird watchers, we got people growing their six plants and maintaining that diversity because people who pursue their passion and plenty of other plant species have this where like you look at pumpkins or other things, people who are backyard breeders are really doing real work in preserving the plant. And if we build institutions to support that, then it will just build more of a culture and a new context for us to develop these sorts of dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. Like apples, for instance, are a good example. There was, at one point, I think there were 7,000 apple cultivars in the, in the world. And apples were generally, since apples are, are, um, are not stable, they're, um, they're uh, heterozygous crop, so you can't just plant an apple seed and get a similar plant as you, from the parent. They were cloned. So an apple tree was a family thing, a family apple tree. So apples were generally named after people's last names. So in the U.S., after the Johnny Appleseed era, we had thousands and thousands of apple varieties available all over the country, just like cannabis cultivars in the 90s and the early 2000s, where there were these little groups, and this is my apple. And then when industrial agriculture happened, they said, well, that doesn't work. We can't have... 7,000 choices, we have to focus what we can sell and what we can market. And people want red apples. So you ended up with Red Delicious, which dominated the market for decades. It's a shitty apple with <laughs> bitter skin and very little sugar and crappy acid content. You know what I mean? It is the blue dream of, of apples. Oh, sorry. Oh, ouch. But... People love red apples, yeah. But then came Fuji's and Honeycrisp and Brayburn and all these amazing apples that actually taste good and are sweet and have good shelf life. And, and once again, it took decades for it to reemerge. You know, industrial agriculture gets a hold of a crop and they homogenize it and they streamline it and they turn it into a widget. That's what industry, that's what it does. And then people get a hold of it and craft people and people who love heirloom plants and heirloom things and small, cool little stuff, and then they turn it into something new, and that's why we now have good apples to eat. But for decades, I don't know if, you all, if any of you guys are over 40, you remember, you go to the market, what'd you have? You had Granny Smith, you had Red Delicious, and you maybe had Yellow Macintosh. Delicious. Macintosh if you were in a nice neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, that was like a fancy apple back in the day. Yeah. But, you know, so that's where we are. And, and, and It's a little different. It's a little different. Well, I mean, apples don't get you high, right? Right, right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. No, they don't. Well, they did in the day because when the apple diversity, cider. it was actually alcohol. That's what spread the apple yeah. population. It was for all for mm -hmm. some hard cider. But it didn't have. But there wasn't diversity in the effect of the high. And that's a big part about can. That's a big part about cannabis. Geno the genome is that it doesn't. It's all different things. This, every different genome provides a different effect. So. It's difficult to navigate that because there's no other crop that works that way, where where they're all different, and we have to pick, you know. Yeah. And I think this also brings up another point. Like, clearly, elephant in the room, doom and gloom, legalization is kind of shitty, and moving into this new regulated world has been a difficult transition for all of us. And there are large, capitalized douchebags out there that are looking to try and take over the entire industry. <laughs> but we're in a situation like, I don't think apple farmers were in the same situation or breeders as we are. I don't think corn farmers in the 1980s are in the same situation that we are. Like, they were crop commodity producers. They were producing huge amounts of acreage of land and had tiny, tiny margins. And when Monsanto in the 1980s decided that they were gonna make a move into making hybridized corn, I don't think that those farmers were positioned the way that we are. 
we're actually aware of a lot of this stuff. We're talking about this stuff today before all of this is happening. Yes, we're in this transition, but federal legalization has not happened. And so because of this, there isn't a full, Monsanto is not 100% in the cannabis industry. They're looking at it. Others like them are looking at it. But we have the opportunity right now to figure out how to preserve and protect this without having to experience all the fuckery that we've seen in every other industry. Right. And other crop and commodity. Yeah. Well, nobody went to jail for growing apples, did they? No, no, no but they, no, I mean, no, not at all. Not at all, exactly. And, and the, So the gravity of the situation in cannabis is a lot heavier. It's than a lot heavier, absolutely. And apples don't save people's lives. Yeah. You know, and cannabis does save people's lives. Absolutely. And it's commoditized. I mean, yeah. they're apples. They're apples, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but the, 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 the comparison is the clonal varieties. Hey, what were the, when, we, when Washington first went legal, after the first year, I think there were only, it seemed like there were only four varieties on the shelf. And I, I don't remember, do you guys remember what that was? Blue Dream. Blue Dream. Gorilla Glue. Was it? I don't think it was Gorilla Glue. But it was just, oh man. Oh, Jack. Uh, two other. I was like, what the, what just happened here, man? It was like, uh, it was a, a really awesome, pleasant shock to go up to Washington after being a grower, you know, indoors only in LA, hydro the whole time. And go up there and see the skill set of the people in the Pacific Northwest. You know, a lot of people let me into their, you know, grows, and I was fortunate enough to, you know, make those relationships and get to to really see what. Uh, and to me, that was like, oh shit, this is craft cannabis. You know, like, wow, you know. And I think Oregon too. There's a lot of skilled growers there. NorCal. I was always scared that NorCal was going to get the OG back in the day. I was like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, you can have the clone, but you're not going to bring it to Mendo, right? You know. Headband. Yeah. Headband. Headband. Yeah, thanks, Mojave. Headband. <laughs> Headband doesn't exist. Josh gave, Josh gave me OG Kush. I'll tell the story now. Is the camera rolling? Sorry, can you turn it off for now? Sorry. Uh, Josh gave me OG Kush, and I brought it up to the Bay Area. And, and I requested, I, I, I mentioned, I said, you know, don't call it Kush. Just call it something else. It was a sour diesel crew. And they called it headband. And they sold it as headband. And they also sold sour diesel as headband. And they also were growing sour diesel and OG Kush in the same grow. And sour diesel, as we all know, puts off nanners at the end and pop beans were in both flowers. So people pulled beans out of those flowers and called those headband. So this is a good phylos bridge. <laughs> Go on Phylos, if you dare. Look, look in the galaxy, and you'll see what is headband. It's either OG Kush, or it's Sour Diesel, or it's something else, which is a seed that came off of OG Kush or Sour Diesel. Yeah. Yeah. Ask him how OG made it to Amsterdam. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. But I, but, I, but I do remember when Sour Diesel showed up in Amsterdam. Very specifically, and uh, I, I assisted those guys with setting up a grow in Amsterdam, and it was the stinkiest weed in town at that time. As we know, there's something about OG, Kim, and sour diesel. Yeah. There's something in there that fuely, terpy thing that is unique and was a game changer. And I, I remember the the nice lady next door was like, "I have no problem with cannabis at all." Grow as much as you guys want, but it smells so strong. I come home, it smells like weed. I go to sleep, it smells like weed. My family comes over, it smells like weed. It smells like weed. It smells like home. It smells like home. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that was and that was a, a really interesting time because those plants, the Kim, Triangle Kush, OG, and Sour Diesel, changed the game in a big way. Yeah. And from that point on. Everything had those three things in it, and it's hard to find things that don't have or that aren't that don't have those one of those three plants in it. So we're we're gonna transition in a couple minutes, but I want to get each of you to talk about 
what kind of mad science you're doing right now. Like, what are you dorking out on right now? I troll the internet. <laughs> um, yeah, like. Nice job. Yeah, I, I got. I live in a shitty county. Calaveras County has a ban right now. Um, hopefully, that's going to change in the upcoming months. Um, I know that they're bringing the, they're drafting the ordinance to bring back regulations now. But, you know, my my science is all about fucking with Philos and trolling my county. <laughs> And I, I, I don't cultivate it. I mean, I, I, I have a, a micro business license here in Los Angeles, um, but I haven't flowered a plant in over two years. So I've been geeking out at going over my seed library and salivating over when I'm going to be able to have the time and the space to start germinating seeds and what could come of that. Um, that's my main geek moment. Nice, man. You can pop them at our place yeah, anytime. Yeah, we hope so. Uh, I'm currently working on a facility in Carpinteria, um, Santa, Bar uh, Santa Barbara County. Uh, maybe some of you have seen some pictures. It's pretty cool. It's my first greenhouse we've worked on you know, as a team, and uh, it's exceeding my expectations. There's a lot of challenges. Definitely different growing in a greenhouse than an indoor. Um, it's uh, indoors, you know, I miss indoor, of course, um, but I'm blown away, like, literally. And, you know, we're just kind of ramping up, too. There's, a, you know, we have, like, kind of a hot rod we've built there, but there's a lot of parts that are super, you know, need to be changed. So um, it's always challenging up there. Uh, there's a lot of regulations that are, like, kind of trying to keep us down. Square footage is an issue there. Everybody knows land use permits. It goes on and on the list. So... Um, if you see us out there, we, you know, we're doing our best to put out, you know, um, the very best product we can. Um, we have a lab, uh, type 7 extract lab. We'll be putting out all kinds of fun stuff, vape cart, sauce, that kind of thing. Um, they're going to probably force us to do distillate. That wasn't my choice. So if anybody sees vape carts out there, I am not a fan of distillate. So, uh, you know, distillate is just, you know... Everybody just stop buying it so we can get back to like full spectrum extract, you know? Yeah, so I mean, um, just getting in places open and trying to function, you know, trying to create, uh, you know, a business, you know, with uh, you have to have a lot of money behind it. There's a lot of pressure. And the actual science behind it, like the fun stuff, is yet to come. Um, but we have a pretty sick lab. My chemists are in the, the audience right now. And uh, really stoked and excited to start, you know, pulling some turps and doing all that. So.